Спасибо большое. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, as I was getting ready for this meeting and certain bilateral meetings I already held on the margins of the APAC summit, I followed your discussions on the TV. I was admiring the courtesy of moderator. And I want to thank you for the great job you did. The topics you were discussing are indeed of great relevance, very important. And this is precisely to discuss those issues that we have all gathered here. Engagement of business community in such fora, and for APEC it has become a rule rather than an exception, to bring together not only heads of states, governments, but representatives, CEOs of major companies, representatives of business community. It has become a rule already. And we are seeing here a very good close connection, close ties between those that work with real politics and real economy. People meet, talk to each other, hear each other, discuss problems that both public authorities and business circles face. And I hope that during the today's discussion and in the following days, we would be able to find solutions or come up with proposals that would help foster development efficiently and would influence the development of global economy generally, and in particular, our regional economy. CEO Summit, like I said, is an integral part of the APEC Summit. APEC economy, you know for sure, but I'll just give you figures, generates over 55% of the global GDP, almost half of global trade, around 45% of all cumulative foreign direct investment in the world. But that is not the most important point. What is, you might ask? The most important thing is that Asia-Pacific region as a larger region, despite well-known complications in the global world economy for the past 20 years, has been growing at the quickest rate increasing financial investment, scientific and technological potential. The leading role implies shared responsibility. All the more it is important today that the global econ economic is fragile. We all know that in Asia Pacific regions, there are also some alarming trends. Uh, reducing growth rate of economies of certain leading countries. But when growth rates slow down, it's one thing, but it's not what matters. The problem is that the trend is persistent. Nonetheless, the growth rate in the Asia-Pacific region is way ahead than in that of other advanced countries. Problems in banking sector and other spheres of economy had negative telling on the growth rate. Unfortunately, unemployment in advanced economies is also growing. Implications were felt by the majority of other states, fluctuations on currency, monetary markets, and stagnation of demand became challenges to all economies with no exceptions. In-depth problems, unfortunately, still have not been resolved. So the situation and the problems might be protracted. There are nonetheless reasons for very cautious optimism. Key economic players are trying to play by the rules, if I may put it that way. They do not take irresponsible unilateral steps that might have unpredictable implications. And such fora as APEC contribute to that. Of course, we discussed that at the G8, G20 as well. But we also deal with them in APEC, so largely the success is a result of our common endeavors. At the top of the crisis, we managed to avoid sliding into the impasse of blunt protectionism or trade wars. On the contrary, we opted for joint steps to overcome crisis, to continue reforming the system of financial regulation, the goals we're facing today, the challenges we're facing today, are probably even more difficult than we've had to face 
at the previous stages of the crisis. What we all need now are new approaches, new modalities of economic development. The global economic landscape is changing literally as we speak. In terms of growth rate, developing markets during the next two decades will be growing much faster than traditional advanced countries of the world. It is a fact of life for everyone that will inevitably imply reorientation of flows of trade and finance. And this would be just one of many manifestations of the global transformation process. It is obvious that these processes are deeply rooted. The world is ushering in the new economical, technological, and geopolitical era. This transition will be long. It will be difficult. For many, it will be painful. Many conventional approaches will have to be revisited. So instead of statements, life will demand from us pragmatic, practical solutions. And I think it is no by chance that it is during the crisis trials, regional integration projects gave an, had got an impetus. This is a very positive phenomenon that offers very promising prospects, especially in light of the continuous difficulties within the WTO and the slippage of the Doha round of trade negotiations. We believe that regional integration, based on understanding and taking into account each other's interests, interests of partners that are geographically close to us, could play the key role in upholstering fundamental principles of open market and free trade ensure dynamic development of the entire global economy. Moreover, dialogue between major regional structures, such as this forum, APAC, NAFTA, EU, or the recently created the post-Soviet space, single economic space, create solid bases to improve rules for global trade and investment it's important to encourage global negotiation process and put forth initiative, initiatives from regions to start a bottom-up process to create expanded integration spaces, establish dialogue between regional and sub-regional unions and associations. It is in that direction in which Eurasian integration is developing with active participation of Russia, free trade area and the CIS. We recently signed and most CIS countries have ratified an FTA treaty and the CIS. The customs union, the single economic space I referred to earlier that was created, established by the three former Soviet states, Russia, Belarus and Kazakhstan, became more than just our common response to the challenges of the crisis. They opened up new doors to implement joint projects with APEC economies. Negotiations on an FTA between the Customs Union and New Zealand are underway. We drafted a joint report on the possibility of launching similar negotiations with Vietnam. Negotiations on the same matter with other countries are also possible. We received dozens, I want to highlight dozens of requests from countries from Asia-Pacific region that are seeking special treatment, special regimes with the customs union. Uh, that is, that comprises three countries I referred to earlier. By the way, here in Vladivostok, the forum, our country is guided by and act with respect to the consolidated position of the integration troika, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. We're not standing still. Now already we're working on the establishment of the Eurasian Economic Union. This would mean an even greater stage of integration, and even more authorities and powers would be delegated to a supranational level. We will be pursuing harmonized microeconomic, technological, and financial policy. Basically, we want to create a powerhouse of regional development. The future Eurasian Economic Union might become some sort of a link connecting Europe and the Asia-Pacific region. I want to highlight specifically, it is exactly at this moment that it's vital to build bridges between different regions of the world. 
in that respect, I believe that one of our priority tasks is to make sure that global and regional markets remain open. We have paid too high price for the illusion of simple solutions. We can use protectionist measures as tools, as medicine. This would help alleviate acute symptoms, but it hampers the general recovery of global economy. It limits trade activity and investment. Let me remind you that in the heat of the crisis, the global trade contracted by 12 percent. It was in 2009. This is the unprecedented fall since the World War II. This, of course, are direct implications of the meltdown of financial markets, but it is also the price we're paying for the outburst of protectionist restrictions. At the end of the day, all of us had to pay the price. No one is trying to deny government's right to protect domestic markets or businesses. They must naturally protect those markets. And I have, know from my own experience, I can tell you how such decisions are taken. You know, Russia's done that, to be very frank with you. But when in 2009, as chairman of Russian government, I came to one of our enterprises in the, north, in the south of the country, they produce agricultural machinery. So I got into the factory and I could see that they have produced many equipment, that they find no buyers to sell to. And it means that the production has stopped. People are not being paid salary. Uh, people have no money to live in. And there's equipment everywhere. You know, it's impossible to pass on the premises. And you can't help thinking, what should we do? The first solution that comes into your hand, that pops to your hand, is to limit import, to protect domestic producers' interests. And we did have to take certain steps, because back then we were not yet members of the WTO, so we had the right to do so. And EU, by the way, did the same thing to protect a number of their own producers in the car industry in the first place. Maybe at certain stages, in certain situations, those steps would have been justified, because otherwise national economies and global economy would have suffered. But it's a different but there's a different question to ask ourselves. We need to have clear-cut, understandable rules. And because it would be wrong to formally, on paper, write one thing and do something completely different in real life. Understanding that in certain conditions, there's nothing else to be done. Once again, we need very clear-cut, easy to understand rules. So we need to dot all the I's and to agree on the acceptable level of protective measures that would help save jobs in the times of crisis. What matters most is trust and certainty in those matters. This is what we need to achieve. It is on the basis of this approach that Russia will continue working, in particular within the framework of the WTO. As full-fledged participants of the organization, we are ready to actively involve in drafting of fair rules of international trade. We believe we need to come up with special rules that would help countries support separate sectors of their economies that are most vulnerable, susceptible to global turbulences. Such measures would help us remedy deficiencies of the regulatory legal framework of the WTO itself would enhance credibility of the organization as a universal structure capable of finding efficient solution to the problems of global trade, respond to new challenges. I want to highlight, ladies and gentlemen, that Russia is in favor of promoting integration agenda of our forum, seeking further liberalization of trade and investment with respect to Bogor goals. For us, this is not merely a declaration. We're expanding our economic presence in the region. When Russia acceded to the WTO, we undertook a number of commitments, which we're going to be honoring, to reduce tariff and non-tariff restrictions. That said, we believe that preferential trade agreements, arrangements, must be as transparent as possible. This would help everyone see advantages and drawbacks 
of uh, effective free trade agreements and those that are yet being drafted and in the future create an optimal integration model. Trade, of course, is not the only thing that is in the focal point of our agenda. Energy security, environment, innovation are becoming more and more relevant. We're engaging in active dialogue on intellectual property rights production. One of the top priorities would be the development of the transportation system of the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, in respect of the recommendation of the ABAC to diversify trade routes, we, together with single economic space partners, are ready to put on the table and offer to everyone geographic infrastructure capabilities of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. If you look at the territories of the three countries, you shall see that we have something to offer. Our single economic space is free from any internal customs or other formalities, and that means we open doors to business circles from the Pacific region, not only into the economies of our countries in terms of economics and infrastructure, but would also create close ties with Europe. By the way, I already mentioned the establishment of the customs union and the single economic space. Let me highlight, because it is very important, both formats were set up and are functioning on the basis of the WTO principles. And I'm confident that it will help all of our economic partners, including those from the Asia-Pacific region, to be more confident when working on the markets of the three countries. To enhance our performance and reliability of supply chains, we need to use proactively advanced technologies, including space technologies. In that respect, Russia also has something to offer to our partners. For instance, transportation hubs and corridors could be equipped with a global positioning system, GLONASS. It took us rather short to create this system. Now it's truly global. We put on orbit 28 satellites, or two of which are backup satellites. It's fully operational and is used very efficiently. Another priority of Russian residency in APAC is food security. Access to food is not a merely economic or social issue. It is a matter of future for millions of people. Uh, Yes, today, if I'm not mistaken, I heard someone, was it moderator, one of the participants of the first part of the meeting, that said that 150 million in this year alone started to face in food shortage. Some experts estimate that it's 200 people, over a billion people suffer from hunger on the planet. So we cannot turn a blind eye to this important socioeconomic factor. Russia, like I said before, has contributed and will be contributing significantly to the stability of food supplies to Asia-Pacific markets in Australia. At this moment in time, our export potential is about 15, if not 20 million tons of grains, according to experts, by the year 2020, our country will be annually producing 122, 125 million tons of grains. This would mean that our export potential will grow to 35 or maybe even 40 million tons. That, of course, does not mean that we're going to limit ourselves to export of food only. It serves our common interest to encourage mutual investments in agriculture expand areas of sustainable agriculture, implement other agricultural projects using, naturally, advanced technologies. Uh, we're also con considering close cooperation in the sustainable use of bioresources, bioresources of the Pacific Ocean in particular, because all of our countries are located on the shores of Pacific and we're interested in sustainable use of our resources. Traditionally, we've been giving great attention to the regional energy cooperation, achieving sustainable balance of energy consumption in the region. Russia is one of the leading and reliable, I want to stress that, suppliers of energy resources is capable of playing one of the key roles. Over the past few years, 
We implemented a number of very important for the region projects. I'm referring to Sakhalin projects of oil production. With some of the participants of the Today's Forum with our U.S. partners, we yesterday mentioned that, and I'm grateful to them for their high assessment of our joint work. Mr. Tillerson, CEO of Axon Marble, yesterday spoke about the implementation of Sahalin projects. So those are international projects. I want to highlight that specifically. So we'll continue working in that direction. We'll continue strengthening our cooperation with partners, work on energy security, not only energy security of Russia, but that of our partner countries in the region generally. Sufficient, safe, reliable energy resources is precondition for sustainable growth, both of global economy and the economy of the Asia-Pacific region. A separate topic is strengthening international cooperation in the field for peaceful use of nuclear power. We all know about the accident in the Fukushima. It became a very serious lesson for all of us. That's why uh, high robust construction and secure, secure ex operation of the nuclear power plants is the requirement which we're going to stick to right now. We're implementing a number of projects, including Asia, we're building power plants in the People's Republic of China. I'm pleased to know that our Chinese friends and partners are satisfied with the quality of the product presented and prepared by our nuclear machine building. Let me note that these projects are major international projects. We are not sticking to certain excessive incomes. We are trying to build relations with technological world, technological leaders in such a way that every component of these large-scale international projects involved leaders specializing in different areas. Around 30% of the project cost, these are costly projects amounting to billions of dollars, from two, three, up to eight billion dollars, each of the projects, I mean. Around 30 or 50% of this pro of uh, the income is given to subcontractors to implement these projects in the regions where these projects have been implemented. That's the approach behind the bilateral agreements concluded with our traditional partners. But security issues are at the forefront of our work. We talk about that, we agree on that, and we develop our work with the friends in Japan, US, and Australia, as well as some other states. We will stick to these principles in the future. Russia is advocating the creation of the regional system for monitoring man-made and natural disasters. Here, again, we are ready for the closest possible cooperation with our partners in the APEC region. Speaking about energy, one cannot but touch upon such an important issue as energy saving and rational use of energy sources, reducing resource intensity of the GDP. Such a model of so-called green growth opens up doors for a new technological order. I'm convinced that the APEC Forum will serve for uniting efforts of economists in addressing key energy issues, and regional business will invest in the development and intake of technologies which will increase energy security of the whole region. An important integration area in the implementation of which we count on active cooperation with the business communities is innovation. I have touched upon this topic here in the Far East Federal University. Let me uh, pay attention to scientific and educational cooperation, the importance of this topic. And our interest is to uh, multiply links with universities, research centers, and scientific organizations to promote student exchanges, contacts between academia. It all contributes to the development of the human capital. A very important step in this direction is the agreement on gradual creation of common educational space achieved this year in the APEC region. APEC economies complement the efforts of each other in scientific and base staff and educational, human educational potential.
our prosperity, it goes without saying, depends to most to great extent on the capabilities. Based on these competitive advantages, we will be able to ensure the new quality of economic growth in the region. This year, with the support of the ABEC partnership, political partnership on innovations and technology was established. We held a dialogue on promising technological issues. Their goal is to engage business in the discussion of conditions for creating market-driven, conducive to innovation development in, in de development environment. I believe it is a very fruitful and promising undertaking. We should take into account the opinion of business and will continue to do so in the future. And of course, we should respect the interests of bus business. And we hope that business will uh, send specific uh, concrete requests to the uh, scientific community. Dear colleagues, Russia is an indispensable part of the Asia-Pacific region. We invest a lot into the development of Siberia and Far East. Now, we are, and we are working and we will continue working at the facilities or premises of the of Far East Federal University. It's a large-scale project aimed at creating a new scientific, educational, and intellectual center in the Far East of Russia. It uh, has, was implemented over around three years. It is a huge work for us, and we think that it's a great beginning in the way of restoration of science. And as I have mentioned it already, the establishment of an intellectual powerhouse here. And we will move forward um, in this direction in the future. Our traditional theme of the EPEC is EPEC means business. Traditionally, in the Russian language, business has two meanings, entrepreneurship and action. And I would like to wish all of us to be action-oriented, focused, courageous and visionary to work and to determine the nature of our joint work. We should set ambitious goals. We should move forward, responding to the challenges of time. And it goes without saying that this is the prerequisite of our joint successes. Thank you very much for your attention.